Tonight, uh, we're going to go deeper into a concept I've introduced and mentioned several times before, the mindscape. And it's going to be somewhat philosophical, and uh, in the course of our discussion, we'll talk about abstract objects and thoughts, and even something called mathematical Platonism. Okay, let's begin. Here is the mindscape. What is the mindscape? Well, we have concrete objects that exist in space and time, like a tree, a car, an atom. And then we have what are called abstract objects, ideas, concepts, and thoughts. And in uh, this theology I'm developing, they exist in what I'm calling the mindscape. So the number two, the play by Shakespeare called Hamlet, the idea of justice, all exist in the mindscape. They don't exist in space and time. So if we walk around the landscape, we can encounter a tree, and the tree was there before we encountered it. And if we travel around the mindscape, we see ideas. And to be complete, I guess I should stipulate an emotescape, a place where all emotions are. And when we travel the emotescape, we encounter various emotions. And so it could be said that we have not five senses, but seven senses. We have uh, vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, which is how we experience the physical world. We have an eye of the heart, let's say, which experiences emotion. And we have an eye of the mind, which is experiences thought. So, for instance, the play Hamlet, written by Shakespeare, lives in the mindscape. The question arises, was it always there? Shakespeare wrote that play about over a little over 400 years ago. But where does the play live? Where does it exist? Does it exist in any book? I mean, the book can be destroyed, but the play Hamlet would still exist. So we can't identify, I don't think, we can identify the play Hamlet with any kind of printout. I mean, first of all, the printouts can change. We can change fonts. We can change language. We could even uh, store the play Hamlet on a computer, and it would look like this. So the idea here is, is that Hamlet exists in the mind state, and these books and a uh, series of zeros and ones are representations of it. Now, this is an idea that various forms of, of this idea have existed in philosophy pretty much from the first. Plato had the idea of forms. And so the, the idea would be that uh, a circle exists in the world of forms, and in the world of matter, we only have approximations to circles. Uh, we don't have a perfect circle in the world of matter. In computer programming, you have the idea of a class, and then you have an object which instantiates the class, just like a circle on, on Earth, a drawn circle, instantiates the idea of a platonic circle of the genuine circle, which exists in the mindscape, if I can take that liberty, although Plato called it the world of forms. Another way this distinction appears is in type token, where if I say cars have four wheels, I'm talking about a type. But if I say my car, I'm talking about a token. I'm talking about an instantiation of the idea of car. So this idea that Hamlet exists in the mindscape and any particular book or any particular uh, series of zeros and ones on a computer are instantiations of it. So then the question arises, if we believe that the play Hamlet exists in the mindscape, was it always there? Or did it just enter the mindscape when Shakespeare wrote it? In other words, did Shakespeare create the play Hamlet, or did he discover it when the eye of his mind was traversing the mindscape. The same question could be asked in another way. Is mathematics discovered or invented? Is, did the number two exist before the Big Bang? If so, it exists. It existed then and it still exists today in the mindscape. So in this sense, the mindscape would be eternal. So if we take the mindscape as having always existed, unchanged, we would say that the mindscape can contains all the thoughts that have been discovered and are waiting to be discovered. And so we would say that, to answer those questions, Shakespeare discovered the play in the mindscape, and mathematics is discovered, and the number two existed 
before the Big Bang. I want to change gears a little bit now and talk about sentience, and then we'll kind of tie things together. Sentience. Uh, the idea of sentience is the capacity to feel, perceive, think. So the idea is that we are sentient beings, but a rock is not a sentient being. And uh, sentience comes from the Latin. Sentient beings have an awareness of their surroundings, their thoughts, if, they, if they're at that level of having thoughts. They can respond to stimuli. And it's interesting that I've mentioned the, f the idea of, the, of seeing a human being has composed of four parts. And uh, we've seen this in the past, how those four parts were represented in Christianity as the ox for a lion. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the ox for body, the lion for emotion, the eagle for intellect and an angel or a man representing the soul. And so the idea here would be that when we experience something like this, we're, we're using these senses. And then when we enter, when we tra traverse the emotescape with the eye of our heart, we're experiencing emotions and there's all sorts of emotions there. And that's when we experience with the eye of our heart, and then with the eye of our mind, we experience the mindscape. And that's where math and Hamlet and all sorts of thoughts live. And so we at least have these seven senses. It could be argued that we have an eighth sense of consciousness, but we won't need that for this discussion. But what we do not have is a sense that senses matter. We cannot sense matter directly. Now, the idea there is that when we see a brick, we see it, and then we can go and touch it. And if we drop it, we can hear it hit the ground. I don't know if I'd want to smell or taste a brick, but the idea is that the brick is something that we create in our mind to make sense of our sensory input. Now, a phrase for something we create in our mind to make sense of things that we do experience is called a theoretical construct, an explanatory concept that is not directly observed but can be inferred from observed or measured data. So in this case, the observed data is the sight, the touch and the sound, and we hypothesize that the brick is there. Here again is the idea of a theoretical construct. So we do not directly sense matter. And the idea here is that for a long time, the atom was a theoretical construct based on various uh, chemical combinations and the way things happen. People hypothesized the atom. And at that, for very many years, it was a theoretical construct until it was verified experimentally. So to dramatize this, the idea is, is that if someone is playing chess on a computer, based on what they see, they could hypothesize that there's a human being at the other end of the computer, that they're playing a human being. But for all they know, they might be playing a robot or something else. So the idea that matter is this theoretical construct is, uh, I think, I mean, not that matter, not, not that we should doubt the existence of the physical world. All I'm just saying is, is that it is at root a theoretical construct. The senses we possess do not sense matter directly. So a material object is a theoretical construct, which makes sense of, our, of, of coherent input. So when we see something and hear it, and we expect to hear it, when, when all the, the senses are coherent, we say the thing is there. Now, incoherent sensory input uh, causes fear, mystery, doubt. For instance, something like in a horror movie, uh, a person is walking and they can feel a cold finger on their neck, but they can't see anyone. Or they are, they are here to sound the rattling chains, but there's no one around them. Or imagine a wall we can feel but we can't see. All those things would engender fear because we, we've been accustomed that certain, certain sensory input goes together and 
others do not. So basically, to sum up, we have these seven senses and maybe consciousness, but that's not necessary for the present discussion. And we have the five senses which sense the physical world. We have the sense of uh, emotion uh, that senses emotion, the heart sense, let's call it. And the, the, the sense of thought, the mind sense, which, which can sense thoughts. And this roams the, the mindscape, this roams the emotescape, and this roams the landscape, so to speak. By the way, I should mention that this idea that matter is a theoretical construct is similar to idealism. Uh, this was developed by Bishop Berkeley, and it's a famous uh, branch of philosophy. But this goes further than what we're doing. This says the view that there is no external reality, that the ideas exist only within our minds. I'm not saying that. I'm not denying that there's an external reality, but I'm saying our only contact with the external reality is through our senses. So we are absolutely sure of what we sense, and we presume that the image we create based on those senses is accurate, and it probably is. I want to move on now to the idea that mathematics is uh, discovered rather than invented is called mathematical Platonism. And uh, that mathematical entities really exist, and they're independent of us. They're really there. And uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is an interesting source of a lot of philosophy. So, mathematical Platonism, Platonism in the philosophy of mathematics, mathematical objects' existence is independent of us in our language and thought. Just as planets and electrons exist independently of us, so do numbers and sets. I have a confession to make. What prompted this was I saw a discussion where someone said that numbers ex do not exist that only physical objects exist. And I'm arguing here that matter is a theoretical construct and the ontological status of numbers is not only equal to the ontological status of uh, matter, or let's say the reality of numbers is not only equal to the reality of matter, but that it exceeds it. Because if you grant the whole idea of the mindscape and the eye of the mind, we sense abstract ideas directly, but matter is only a theoretical construct that we create in our minds. And it may exist, and it probably does exist in the physical world, but nonetheless, our experience of it is only through our senses. So therefore, it remains a uh, theoretical construct. By the way, I should mention that mathematical Platonism is not the only view of mathematics. Most uh, mathematicians seem to hold that view, but there are some that have the idea of formalism, another view of uh, the reality or unreality of numbers, let's say. So I just want to point that out. So uh, basically, we could include consciousness. That would be the topic of another uh, episode. But basically, I'm saying that we have not five senses, but seven senses. And that when we feel something, it's just like if I see a tree and I tell you about it and you go there the next day, you see the same tree. And I'm saying that if I experience something and a day later you experience that same thing, it's, you are really experiencing the same thing. That is a thing in the emotescape. And if I have the thought that two plus two is four, I am seeing a thought in the mindscape. And if you see that thought, you and I are looking at the same thing. It's just it's not in the physical world. Anyway, that's my view of things, and uh, tonight we've gotten more deeply into the mindscape, a concept which I've used a few times in the past, and uh, I got to put in a, a plug for mathematics, the reality of numbers, and since I mentioned before I teach math in a community college, that was a subject near and dear to my heart. Thank you for listening.